Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, thank you again to Nadia for and the team for organizing uh, such a great retreat. Even though we had a couple bumps in the road yesterday, could, we, we couldn't fix plates. So no. anyway, um, <clears throat> as uh, Nadia mentioned, we have a very special guest with us today, uh, Bishop Tom, Bishop Tom Dowd, Bishop Dowd. So I said to him, like, what do you prefer to be called? And he's like, I'm good with Bishop Tom. Uh, in more formal settings, obviously, Bishop Dowd. But I've had the opportunity to uh, have dinner with Bishop Tom, and we've had a few conversations, and I'm so very grateful um, that we have someone like uh, Bishop Tom with us. He really is hands-on. He wants to get to know us. Um, and when, I, when we asked him, um, would you mind doing a Mass for us? He's like, sure. What else can we do? Uh, because he wants to spend time with you. He wants to get to learn more about us. He wants to get to learn more about our, our Catholic school board. He wants to get to know about each of your schools. And uh, we had a, he shares some great stories with me and, uh, at, at the dinner, and, and one of them was uh, when he had gone to visit Elliot Lake. And typically, and I'm sure many of you who live in the north and the east <coughs> can relate to this, that sometimes when visitors come, it's like a day in and out. Uh, and he, um, Bishop Tom shared with me that he spent three full days in Elliot Lake um, because he wanted to meet with you know, the mayor and the schools and, and uh, do a few quality visits, and I think um, that really resonated with me that, uh, he, I mean, he's a bishop, so he's kind of, you know, a big deal. So I think he got there uh, for good reason, uh, but I mean, it's a lot to be said when someone is uh, very genuine and, uh, and hands-on. So thank you very much for being with us today, and I turn it over to you. Please offer a warm welcome to the show. Thank you. It was uh, three full days in Elliott Lake visiting schools, but actually eight days in Elliott Lake visiting the entire community. So it's been, uh, it's been a really interesting exercise getting to know this diocese. I am originally from Montreal, as many of you probably know. Uh, born and raised there, went to school there, went to seminary there, did my graduate work there, was a priest there, bishop there. The longest I have lived outside of Montreal is actually the last year and a half that I've lived in Sudbury. So it's been a, an interesting transition. There's nothing quite like moving to Northern Ontario in December <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic with a blizzard raging. Anyway, but uh, it, I, I've uh, learned to love my car, lots of driving. Uh, I got a brand new car when I got to Northern Ontario, so I'm only up to 42,000 kilometers at this point after a year and a half. So really trying to get to know the territory, but I have to say it already feels like home. I was in Toronto at the beginning of the week, and as I was driving back, you know, big city, bright lights in the evening and all that, I was like, what am I doing here? And then I managed to make it back to the Canadian Shield, and I felt my blood pressure going down, you know. <sighs> almost hit a bear crossing the road, but that's a whole other story. That's true, actually, it almost happened. So, uh, the subject that I've been asked to address with you, tied to the whole theme of wellness, is spiritual wellness. And so I'm, I used to be a university teacher, so you'll have to uh, bear with me if I sound like I'm a university teacher, but I kind of am. And uh, I always think better, I'm one of those teachers who thinks better with a piece of chalk or uh, with a marker in their hand and a flip chart close by. So that's what I, I hope to share with you is some insights on the topic of spiritual wellness, actually drawn from one of the courses <coughs> that I taught when I was in university. Uh, now the word wellness as such is a relatively recent word in terms of common usage, so you're not going to find it in the Bible. But you will find the concept of wellness in the Bible through a word that we don't usually hear outside of church. It's one of those churchy words, but it's actually a word that summarizes the concept. And when we break it open, we see that it has a much broader sense than the, the narrow kind of uh, attribution we give to it. And it's this word here. Salvation. There's a churchy word for you. But salvation is from the Latin word salus. 
salus means health. So, anybody of uh, Italian extraction in the room? <laughs> A salute, few? Salute, yeah. yeah, salute. Or, you know, you're going to toast someone, right? So you lift your drink and what do you say? Salute. To your health. That's where it comes from. That's what it means in its original sense. So when we say Jesus is the Savior, very often, you know, people narrow that concept down to, okay, you know, heaven and afterlife and that kind of thing. But really, when we say Jesus is the Savior, or we are saved, or that kind of term, it's actually speaking, Jesus is the health bringer. Okay, he's the, the, you might say, the wellness bringer. And so that's really what the concept means. And when we look at it in its original sense, then we can actually uh, break the idea open. And we find that there are actually four kinds of health, or spiritual health, spiritual wellness, because you just have to look at the ministry that Jesus did and you can immediately see what those four angles, you might say, the four corners of the whole concept of salvation, how it all sort of fleshes out. And then, once we look at that, you know, there's a saying in philosophy, you divide in order to unite. So in other words, you take a concept, you divide it into its constituent pieces, so you can look at each, and then when you bring it all together, you're no longer just looking at it as one uniform block, you have the nuances that the concept includes. So that's what I'm hoping to do for us today. And we're gonna use Jesus himself, the savior, the health bringer, the wellness bringer, as our prism to look at this idea. So when we look at uh, the concept of health, wellness, We can see that it, as I said, it breaks down into four basic things, which have analogies outside of spirituality. So when you consider public health, right, the, the intervention of authorities in order to improve the health of the common populace, and when you look at the history of health and medicine and all that sort of thing, we discover that the greatest threat to people's health throughout history has actually been ignorance. It's been a lack of knowledge and information. Before microscopes came along, nobody knew about germs. But once they discovered germs, boy, that made a difference to the approaches to public health. Right? It, the whole idea of if you wash your hands, people get less sick was a relatively recent invention, surprisingly enough. People had a, a sense, uh, certainly centuries ago in the Middle Ages, that if somebody got sick with certain diseases, others could catch it. But the only measure they had to deal with, you know, the, avoiding the spread of communicable disease was quarantine and isolation. Uh, a method that's come back in vogue lately. <laughs> but really, if you don't have any other method to deal with it, that's all you can do, right? Keep people isolated and away from others. And the lack of knowledge, the lack of information on how to deal with public health means we kind of we kind of broke in the dark otherwise. So the first real method or, or measure or contributing factor to wellness or lack thereof is knowledge of, first of all, the functioning of the body, how it works, and then, of course, knowledge of how it heals, uh, knowledge of how, it, you know, we're, we're constantly being bombarded by stuff that the body has to deal with. There's a, there's a ton of germs in this room right now. Uh, there's, you know, ultraviolet rays from the sun, and there's you know, pollution from cars and all that stuff. The body is in a constant motion of trying to deal with all of the things coming in, processing food, but not everything in the food we eat we keep, you know? So uh, all that kind of thing. The body's in a constant interaction with its environment. So knowledge of the body plus the environment.
Well, if you translate that into spiritual stuff, then it comes down to knowledge of the body plus the soul. Spiritual wellness involves our spirit. So what, what is the interaction of the body and the soul? Are these just two separate things? Is the idea of the soul just an abstraction, you know, just a, a churchy word without any real substance? It turns out we have in our Catholic tradition 2,000 years of reflecting on the nature of the soul and how it interacts with the body. And then, of course, its environment as well. There is a, a spiritual context in which we live. So Jesus, as Savior, his first role as Savior is actually as teacher. Jesus, in fact, that's what they called him, right? Some of the people called him rabbi, which means teacher. And most of the time, you know, he was going around. Yeah, he did a few miracles here and there, true. But the bulk of his work was actually teaching. He was trying to bring people to a greater knowledge of their spiritual environment and greater knowledge of themselves so that they could become protagonists in their own spiritual story. Now, you know, who is the first person responsible for your health? It's you. Right? People say, oh, if I, I feel okay, otherwise I'll go to the doctor. But there, there's stuff we got to do. We are the ones who ultimately take the first step in anything dealing with our own health. You know, uh, think of mental health. You can drag somebody to therapy, but if they don't want to be there, it's not going to do them any good. Spiritual health is the same thing. So, Jesus teaches us in order to give us the knowledge, therefore, with that, some skills, in order to look after our spiritual environment. We'll get into these in greater detail, but I just wanted to bring up sort of the first, the, the four categories in general before we kind of dive into these a bit more. So, knowledge of the body and its environment. Our knowledge of the soul and its spiritual environment, I should say. So, Jesus saves by being a teacher. Now, the, uh, that it's great to know, uh, as I said, that one of the greatest threats to public health is ignorance, so once we know that. But there is another threat to public health, which is disease. I mean, COVID comes along. Uh, obviously, when we knew nothing about it, it was a lot more stressful. And as research happened and we knew more about it, people's stress levels started to go down. We had a better sense in, in public health how to deal with it. Remember the first lockdown? Mm -hmm. Where everything shut down. You know, absolutely everything. Um, gradually we learned, but the fact, simple fact is, the reason we had to do all that is because there was a virus in the first place, right? So, when we think about Jesus as Savior, this is the category of Jesus as a doctor. Are there things that are spiritual diseases? that need to be dealt with. Where someone needs to intervene. Well, it turns out there are. There are some of these. And the part of the soul that these affect most directly is our conscience. And so the most uh, common infection, you might say, that the soul gets is uh, the good old-fashioned sin. When we choose to do something and it affects us in such a way that it actually <coughs> harms the life of the soul. There are other things that can happen to us from the outside as well that can affect uh, the soul. 
Um, there's a spiritual disease called scruples. I don't know if you've ever heard of scruples. Uh, scruples is this spiritual equivalent of uh, OCD. Basically, it's a, uh, uh, this idea that um, it's a disproportionate sense of sin. Sin is the actual disease, but scruples is where we kind of take it to the next level and be, people start to obsessively ruminate about their own interior situation, their own interior attitude. It can cause a lot of suffering. It's often tied to, it comes out in forms of anxiety. But leaving that aside, the habitual repetition of sin, there's the individual ones, but when they repeat, they become vices. And that's when we say someone is a vicious person. They actually have developed habits that just, in a sense, ignore the weaknesses of their soul and even kind of glorify in them. And it usually winds up paying, we wind up paying a price in the long run for it. I mean, you know, we, you're teachers, right? You deal with young people and you see them doing something wrong, something that you just know is not good for them, and you kind of hope that they learn their lesson fast and they don't fall into a habitual pattern. You're hoping that they don't develop a vice, because once vices set in, they're very difficult to deal with. <laughs> so Jesus as doctor, if the core of those things are individual choices that aren't good, then Jesus is there in order to help us identify them and to help us heal from sin. You know, the whole saying, why did he die on the cross? He died for our sins. That's a phrase, but it's going to the heart of a very, very important aspect of our wellness. People whose conscience bothers them, it's a use of their free will, but it can affect your sleep. It can literally affect your physical health when something like that happens. So that's Jesus as doctor. So the third category, um, all right, suppose we, we know aspects of our physical health. We've read all the books, okay, and we don't have any particular illness going on. That doesn't mean we can immediately run out and do a marathon, okay? You can read books about bodybuilding but it is not actually going to build your muscles, right? The knowledge alone is not enough. And the fact that one does not have any, you know, particular outstanding illness, Arnold Schwarzenegger can get a cold, right? So he'd be, the cold is category number two, but in order to develop that strength, we need positive habits, not just about ne avoiding the negative, you need positive wellness habits in order to go from being sort of at normal health to being at a level of excellence. So the third category is something, uh, I'm going to give you another churchy word, theosis. So theosis in English means divinization. In other words, becoming more and more like God be divinized, to gradually become more and more divine. Uh, that is not something you're born with, it's something we grow into. And so this is Jesus as coach. For all you uh, people who teach phys ed or coach a, coach a sport of some kind for the students, you are imitating Jesus when you do that because you're trying to help the young people develop a positive, you know, an improved aspect of their physical nature, of their physical health. Well, there are spiritual aspects to this as well. There is spiritual development.
you know, which, which involves, well, I mean, if the body would be greater strength, greater endurance, you know, greater lung capacity, all that kind of stuff. The soul has those capacities too, which can grow. There's a sense that the soul can stretch in order to be able to receive more of God's presence. We get divinized the more our soul stretches, but the stretching of the soul does involve our own, our own work. It's one of the ideas, uh, why, why are we better off to live than to not live? You know, even if we don't have any sins or anything like that, from a spiritual side, it's because we have a greater opportunity to stretch our soul. And then finally, <coughs> the fourth category of health. Okay, suppose you've read all the medical textbooks. You know, you know all the knowledge of how the body works. Suppose you don't, as far as you know, have any illnesses, you feel great. Suppose you go to the gym regularly so you know you're in peak physical form and you're lying in bed at home and the fire alarm goes off. Is there a threat to your health? Absolutely. And none of the other things you just did are gonna help you in that moment. Your first step, get out of the house, right? Get your kids, hopefully get your spouse if you have one, and get out of the house, right? So, <laughs> and so uh, in order to, and if you're in a high rise, then you pray that there's gonna be a really big ladder coming your way. So sometimes we need rescuing. Sometimes we need special outside intervention to come and assist us, uh, not because we ignored any aspect of our health before or anything like that, it's just that's the situation. So this is actually Jesus as rescuer. So the need for outside intervention and you know I, I use the example of a fire. Um, the, I was in Toronto, as I said, staying in a hotel, 23rd floor, and the fire alarm went off. And so, you know, the first thing that happens is the intercom comes on and they say, don't try and use the elevator. Thinking, I have to walk down 23 flights of stairs? Okay, you know, <laughs> but I thought, like I had seen people on my floor with walkers and, and stuff like that. Oh my gosh, like, what are they going to do? Now, it turns out there was no fire. And they, they give you, please stay calm, remain in your room, here are some directions, that kind of thing. And I could hear the fire engines, you know, coming down the, the road outside uh, the hotel. But the first step, obviously the early warning system, is simply the fire alarm. That's all it is. And then the intercom, there's a whole network of stuff that's there to intervene, to keep us safe, to give us direction, and that sort of thing. So. The outside intervention, or what we would call, in churchy words, divine intervention, can have a very dramatic nature. I mean, you pray for a miracle, and if you get it, that's very dramatic. But are there mundane miracles, as ordinary as having a fire alarm that works in your home? You barely notice it, uh, you're just glad it's there. And every so often it chirps annoyingly because you've got to change the battery, but apart from that, it's kind of there and it's something we want to maintain so that it can continue to do its work. So there are dramatic divine interventions, but then there are also mundane ones, fairly mundane, by which God intervenes directly. <coughs> So that's the four sides of health. You know, if we think about it for ourselves, staying in that hotel room, the fire alarm, the firefighter showing up, all of that is part of the, my personal health, right? If something had gone on, I'm really glad they were there because my health could have otherwise been very badly affected by a fire in a hotel. They're doing lots of renovations in that hotel, so 
All you need is for some blowtorch to go wrong and poof, we're in deep trouble. So those are the four things. And as you can see, you know, um, the whole question of knowledge is the starting point. What is a healthy diet? Uh, you know, what are some basic elements of the functioning of our bodies? That's where it all starts. Um, avoiding illness and knowing how to deal with it when it comes. This is a fairly important piece. People go to medical school, study for years in order to study just one aspect of the body, right? I mean, imagine doing all that medical school and then saying, I think I'd like to do more to learn about skin, become a dermatologist. I mean, it's amazing how people zero in and then zero in even more. We're so amazingly complex that we invest massive resources in being able to deal with this sort of thing. Um, demonization, well, it, you don't, uh, this isn't subsidized by the government usually, although things like physiotherapy might be, you know, there are certain aspects that are, but generally your local gym is not subsidized by the government, but it can be extremely important um, to be able to undertake our, spirit, our, our physical development. And finally, well, we have you know, fire stations and police stations and all kinds of things designed. I mean, you call 911, that's 911, right? So that we have all that support. Massive social resources in order to deal with this in our bodies and our souls. Also, there are resources to help us. And our, like I said, for our physical health, we are the ones with the primary responsibility. With our soul health, same thing. Spiritual wellness starts with us. Salvation comes from God, just like our very lives come from God, but it, we have an important role to play as well. And when people do live According to the principles of spiritual wellness, what we find is that pretty much everything else is assisted as well. So I'd, I'd like to just shift gears and talk about what is our Catholic tradition about the connection between body and soul. Uh, that's the knowledge piece, so we'll start with that. So. Body and soul are two distinct realities. They are not the same thing. But the Catholic understanding is not that body is sort of over here and soul is over here as two separate entities. The, our tradition, and this goes back to the Jewish tradition, it goes back to uh, actually the story of the creation of Adam and Eve. It describes, after God creates uh, the first man, he breathes the breath of life into him. You know he's made out of the, the dirt of the earth. That's why he's called Adam, by the way. It's from the word Adama, which means the clay, the soil, the dirt. And so he breathes into him life, and it says that he became a living spirit. So in other words, body and soul are united together in the person. And so the... The two concepts are not, they're distinct, but they're not separate. We have functions that relate to our body and functions that relate to our soul. And there's this overlap space. That's our mind. In the New Testament, St. Paul mentions three aspects of the human person, the body, the mind, and the soul. The psyche, which is where we get the word psychology, and the pneuma, pneuma means air, that means the breath of life in us, that means our soul. So our body, if you look at our ability to interact with our environment, the body is the place for our five senses, Obviously, 
And the, it's the place, uh, our brains are part of all of that. So our soul is the zone for um, abstraction. and free will. The free will part is, part is particularly important because it turns out that uh, our bodies are made of molecules, chemicals, which are made of atoms, which are made of quarks and gluons and electrons and neutrons and all that. And none of those have free will. So if none of the parts of our body individually have free will, they're all subject to the laws of physics 100%, then where does free will come from? And so it's always been, even going back to the ancients, the idea that the free will, if we actually have free will, it requires a spiritual side. It's got to come from outside of the material universe, the purely material universe. And so where soul, which has knowledge, which has free will, interacts with the five senses, that overlap between the two, that's our mind. There is some debate among the spiritual writers where memory is stored, uh, simply because we know that if you get a good clunk on your head, you can lose your memory. Uh, people with dementia lose their memory. That's a physical ailment that's affecting the flesh of their brain. But does that mean that when we die, we forget everything? The body's dead, the soul forgets everything. So there must be some kind of physical memory and spiritual memory. And so it's usually put in the overlap piece here. Um, and it may be that there's a distinction between the two. But all of this is united. There's a saying among the philosophers, all knowledge starts in the senses. If you, didn't, if you weren't able to see, hear, taste, touch, smell, you would have no contact with the outside world. So all knowledge starts here. But God, although the knowledge of our physical environment starts here, it is possible for God to intervene directly through the soul. That's what we call inspiration. When we say the Bible is inspired, what we're saying is the Lord intervened directly in the abstract portion, in the knowledge portion of the soul. The, the people were receiving these concepts, these ideas. It's not like they were hearing words. That would involve their ears. That's this side. But they were receiving this knowledge, and they turned to their memory, they turned to their language, and they found the words to express what God was trying to say. So how do we, how do we engage in spiritual wellness training for this part of who we are? First of all, to get to know our soul, how it works. And secondly, to feed the soul with a mind that is developed so that when God speaks to us, we are able to hear. So there, honestly, if you want to undertake spiritual wellness in category one, where this is Jesus as teacher, there is no better way than getting to know the Bible. That's step one. Because if the Bible really has concepts and words that were inspired by God, it means that when God is going to talk to you and your soul, it's going to seem familiar. You're going to, like, it, it's like learning a language, right? If you go to a country and you don't speak the language, they'll use all kinds of words, and it means nothing. But if you learn the words, then when they speak, you're going to be like, oh, wait, I remember that word in class. As you start to learn a language, it just starts with a few words that seem familiar or a few scenarios that you remember. I don't know if you've had the experience of learning a language, but very often it starts with us uh, learning phrases in common situations, being learned how to order coffee, you know, in a coffee shop. So you go to Italy and, un caffè, per favore, you know, and suddenly you get a coffee and you feel like you won, a, won the lottery, you know, like, I can do this. 
Uh, for me, my test of learning a language when I was learning a new one was, can I take a taxi on my own? Forget the test at the end of the class. Can I take a taxi to get to the airport? That was my goal. So you, through familiarity, God speaks to us and is able to teach us directly. The other aspect I would say, if you want to be able to enter into this in spiritual wellness, involves places and zones of silence. Of physical silence helps, interior silence silence, quiet helps. Uh, just being able to settle down, going on a retreat for example, uh, if we're not constantly loading it up with stuff and distraction, that silence in the soul means that it's a lot easier to hear or sense the movement of God in our soul. So the Bible, some good old-fashioned silence, some people, they just like to take time in the evening. And for me, one aspect, and this is just a practical suggestion, is keeping a spiritual diary, spiritual journal. Uh, because we can get these ideas that come to our minds, but it's best to write them down right away when they come. Just to, if God is inspiring us, who wants to forget? And it provides a thread in our spiritual life. And literally, we merge our experiences of the day with the words of God himself and our wellness quotient, or our ability to know ourselves and know our own heart, know our own soul, rises dramatically. These are some very simple, practical tips to living this part of our spiritual wellness for Category 1. For category two, um, spiritual diseases affecting our conscience, sin, and vices. How do we deal with this? The most effective initial tool, first of all, this is not about making people feel bad about themselves, quite the reverse. But if we're sick, you know, I don't know if you've ever known people who, they were obviously sick, but they absolutely refused to go to a doctor because they didn't want to be told they were sick. Some people are laughing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or they go and they say, yeah, I don't feel well, doc, and oh, where does it hurt? Well, I don't want to tell you. Well, then why did you go? You know, what are you doing here? Um, so there has to be some measure, first of all, of humility. Humility, by the way, is not about going around saying, oh, what a worm am I. Humility, the spiritual definition of humility, is the ability to live in the truth, as opposed to live in denial. Denial is not just a river in Egypt, obviously. Uh, <laughs> denial is a barrier to spiritual growth. And so, when it comes to our, our moral qualities, we have to be willing to look at ourselves. Now, we're not condemned to simply look at it and say, like a person who's sick and goes, oh boy, I'm really sick, I'm really sick, I'm really sick. I've known people who almost kind of enjoyed being sick because they got to go for pity or self-pity, that kind of thing. Finally, you're like, well, you shut up about it. Go see a doctor, you know? Well, uh, when it comes to spiritual sickness, we, uh, because it involves not things that happen to us so much as things we did, it's a little more embarrassing. You know, another thing that keeps people from going to the doctor is when the thing that's making them not well can be traced directly to something stupid they did. And it's like, oh, I really can't go see the doctor because, you know, I'm going to get judged or something. Well, the sin, obviously, that's every single time. And so <laughs> it makes it a little bit harder to tackle this part of our soul. But, that's why we have confession, right? Confession is there because we have specialists who are trained to be able to hear everything we do. That's why the seal of the confessional is there. The seal of the confessional is the earliest form of professional secrecy we have in Western civilization. Prior to the lawyers not being able to talk, prior to doctors not being able to talk, it started with the seal of confessional, precisely so that people could 
know that whatever they say will be kept in confidence. I can tell you, as a priest, after six months, I had heard every single one of the Ten Commandments, including Thou Shalt Not Kill. Six months. After 20 years, you know, people are like, oh, I, I don't know if I want to tell you this. And I like, I've heard everything, you know? So uh, the idea is we, we're professionals to help people work through that. But again, we can't do it for you. It starts with each of us doing, having the humility to say, okay, I'm willing to look at myself in this way. And then something called the examination of conscience. I don't know how many of you uh, have ever had this experience. They, you can actually find published lists of examinations of conscience. You can look it up on the internet. It can be like 100 questions long. You know, did you do this? Did you do that? How many times did you do this? And that sort of thing. And those can be helpful, particularly as we're growing in our spiritual life, because we want to be thorough. But uh, often the examination of conscience can be done much more simply. I'll share with you a story. I was on a retreat. And there was a, I was a seminarian, I wasn't a priest. Uh, I was on retreat and there was a, a priest coming to the retreat to hear confessions, a couple of them were coming. And I expressed to the people at my table that I was really looking forward to going to confession. And one of the guys at the table said, what are you going to confession for? You're a seminarian, you don't have any sins. I looked at him, I can assure you I, I have sins, like I'm, I'm not perfect. And then he paused and he goes, you know, I would go to confession, but honestly, I don't think I have anything to confess. He says, I haven't murdered anybody, I haven't, I haven't robbed any banks, you know, I, I think I'm basically a good guy. I, and he was being very sincere. He said, I honestly could not think of anything to bring to confession. And I said to him, you're married, aren't you? And he said, yeah. And I said, if I was to ask your wife for any suggestions <laughs> of things to bring to confession, do you think she would have any? Oh, yeah. I said, well, why don't you start with those? It doesn't have to be complicated. But, you know, the, the problem with this fellow is not that he didn't have any sins. That wouldn't even be a problem. Uh, the problem was he just wasn't able to look at himself. He had not developed the habit of self-examination, the examination of his conscience. But just by saying, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Uh, doing an exam, a, a personal self-exam at the end of every day. Uh, using the published lists, going through the Ten Commandments. One time I was in a parish during Lent, we would put the Ten Commandments up on the overhead screen and just read them out. Just read them out loud together as a parish at the beginning of Mass. And one of the priests would go to the confessional and we had plenty of business. <laughs> just through just through people seeing it, you know. So very often with this process, people will come and they, they're not even sure they want to be there, but they're willing to take the step and it they feel that relief that comes from their soul suddenly not having this poison in it, and they want to come back. And so over time what happens is you go from confessing your sins, I did this, I did that, to sinfulness. Because one of the things about confession is, after a while, you start repeating yourself. You go back to the same ones over time. Because you discover which ones are habitual versus the one-timers. And that's where we start to uproot the vices in our life. That's where we go from correcting our past to building for a greater future. That's Jesus as the doctor, the divine doctor, working through that very beautiful sacrament. Um, you know, is it possible to go through life with all kinds of uh, stuff that, you know, leaves us sort of limping in our conscience? Sure. Well, why, why do that? It doesn't make sense to me. Jesus' coach, spiritual development. So what does this involve? As I mentioned earlier, this is the stretching of the soul.
There are actually spiritual coaches in our tradition called spiritual directors. In French, the term is accompagnateur, literally someone who journeys with you. And having a spiritual coach, either on a, a regular basis, or even just occasionally through doing something like a retreat, uh, a directed retreat they would be called, is extremely valuable. I know people whose lives have been changed just by participating in exceptional moments like that and developing a profound spiritual relationship. Um, our Catholic vision of marriage actually involves two people who become, at their best, coaches and supports to one another, not just in their family life, but in their spiritual life. Each takes on a responsibility for the wellness of the other financially, materially, <coughs> but even spiritually. So there can be, where we don't have an actual coach, human being available for us, uh, although, you know, our priests and our parishes, hopefully they're able to do that. Some do it better than others, quite honestly. It's, it's not a skill everybody has. Not every doctor is called to also be a fitness trainer, you know. Some of them I wouldn't want to be my fitness trainer, but I'm happy that they know how to prescribe medicine. Um, but if we can't get a person, then this is access to books, YouTube videos, uh, conferences, retreats, and frankly, just good spiritual friendships. How many people do you talk with on a regular basis about your prayer life? Something about spirituality, it's the most intimate part of who we are. I remember uh, helping couples prepare for marriage. And uh, as part of the marriage prep course, we had to talk about fertility and reproduction and uh, procreation and the church's teaching on that. And they would all be like, like, most of them were already living together before they were coming for marriage, it's just the way things are nowadays, and they're like, you know, Father, we know plenty about procreation, eh? like, we pretty much got that down. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, then we would talk about their spiritual life uh, as a couple, uniting spiritually their ability to share the deepest parts of their heart with each other, not just their bodies. And they, they were like, what are you talking about? Sometimes they're even sort of afraid. No, no, we can't go there. I'm like, you know, there may be times in your life where the physical intimacy will drop off for a period. Maybe the physical health of another person, the other partner. But your spiritual health, because sharing what's going on in our heart with another person is deeply intimate. And so to have a profound spiritual friendship just somebody who we can share transparently with and openly with and share the movement of God in our heart, not just what's going on in our life, is Jesus can work through that person. Spiritual directors, spiritual coaches are trained for it, but even just the person who loves us and whom we trust can do a lot for us. And then access to all these other resources. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you follow like a YouTube channel or something, very often we follow uh, somebody because we like what they say and it makes sense to us and we develop a trust and almost a relationship with that person, that podcast or whatever, even though we've never met them. But we kind of get to know them and see where they're coming from. You know, worthwhile stuff like that helps our souls to stretch. Finally, divine intervention, where God intervenes directly. Does God still do this? If you read the stories of Jesus, he heals the sick, he casts out demons, he walks on water, uh, turns water into wine, one of our favorite miracles, obviously. Uh, does God still do stuff like that? Remember, the ones you read in the Bible are the ones that, that's the ambulance or the, the fire truck showing up. But the fire alarm is still part of the system. It's more mundane, but it's still a divine intervention. 
The answer is yes. The Lord still works. If you want access to divine intervention on a regular basis, it is through the sacraments. You bring a baby to be baptized. How many of us have brought a baby to be baptized or been part of a baptism? Pretty much everybody. You bring a baby to be baptized, you pour water, well you don't, but somebody pours water on the baby's head, there is a visible effect, the baby gets a wet head. This is not why we bring babies for baptism. We do the visible sign because we're looking for divine intervention. We want a spiritual effect that none of us can do, only God can do. We go to Mass. Uh, we'll have Mass shortly. You're going to hear me say words along the lines of, I'll put my hands over the bread and the wine and say, let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy. And you're going to see me at one point, after I've sort of done the words and lifted the bread and the wine for adoration, I'm going to genuflect. Because it's our faith that that's no longer bread and no longer wine. That has become the real presence, the body and blood of Jesus Christ himself. That's divine intervention. It's a miracle. We're going we're gonna to be together for a miracle. It's not the flashy ones, but if our faith is real, we will be part of a miracle within the next hour. So, sometimes the, the mundane ones have even a flashier effect. I was a hospital chaplain. One of the sacraments is the anointing of the sick. And I have done a lot of anointings of the sick in the hospital as a hospital chaplain, because it turns out there's a lot of sick people in the hospital, so you get a lot of chances to do it. And uh, speaking about that cooperation between us and God, I had this one day, I call it my uh, two and a half uh, anointings day. So I showed up because I had gotten a call. There was a gentleman who had cancer in his bones. It was a very painful cancer. Uh, and he was in his terminal phase. And the nurse, when she called me on my pager, said, get here fast. We'll be surprised if he lasts an hour. So I got to the room, and he, was, he had a mask on just to be able to help him breathe. And he wasn't lucid. He was kind of thrashing around. And the family was there. And <coughs> they're like, what do we do, Father? What do we do? I said, relax. We're going to pray. And so I, I got out my holy oils, and I anointed the man, and I said, the purpose of the anointing is for healing. So we have to look for the healing. Now, who's that? Terminal bone cancer. So look for the healing is kind of a bold thing to say, but that's the miracle we're looking for. So I anointed the man, and he immediately became lucid. He couldn't speak because he still had the mask on his face. But you can have an entire conversation with people just with your eyes. And so he, he, all of his family was there, except for one, but all of his family was there. His wife was there. They were able to look at each other with great tenderness. He was able to understand their words to him. His son, I remember said one wasn't there. His son lived in Ottawa. They were leaving messages for him. You have to get here as fast as possible. Ottawa is two hours away. The guy was supposed to pass away within the hour. But he lasted one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. His son showed up. They had the conversation with the eyes. And then he passed away very peaceably. He was not cured of bone cancer. Was he healed? Yes. Look for the healing. He received that. I stuck around for that four hours with the family. And as I was walking up and down the hallway, anointing number two happened. I saw this gentleman. Those of you who heard me give my, my confirmation homily, you may have heard this story. So uh, this gentleman who was in the hallway, hey, Father, how's it going? I was dressed like this, so easy to spot. And uh, he was there. I could tell he was a patient because he had on one of the hospital robes with the air conditioning in the back. You know? <laughs> so um, his daughter was there. He's an older gentleman. I said, what's going on? Well, Dad is here because he needs a heart operation, but when they did the test, the scan, they found a tumor in his chest. So they can't operate on his heart because he has a tumor, and they can't operate on the tumor because he has a bad heart. So we don't know what to do. Uh, the doctors, this is a Wednesday, 
The doctors are going to go in with a probe on Friday to pull a piece of the tumor, test it. Maybe they can give him some chemo or something, but we don't really know. I said, would you like to receive the anointing of the sick? Um, it's, you're sick, you qualify. It's not just for the dying. The other guy was like really dying, but this, you're sick, you can have it. Sure, it's for healing. Let's do it. So we prayed, and Saturday, the test was the Friday, Saturday morning got an email. Father, it's a miracle. They went in with the probe to get a piece of the tumor. They couldn't find it. So they did another scan. It disappeared. I was a little skeptical, right? But uh, maybe they mixed up the scans or something. But it turns out the guy had had, I didn't know this at the time, but he had had three scans. And they had seen the tumor growing from scan to scan. And the fourth scan was blank. So they did the heart operation. No t they looked for the tumor. No tumor. I've always wondered, if God was going to heal the guy, why not heal his heart at the same time? You know? <laughs> Give him a two-for-one deal on healings. <laughs> but that's not how it works, right? It's not a cure. It's a healing. This guy's problem was his health situation was blocked. By removing one barrier, then the doctors could do their part. We are protagonists in our own physical and spiritual health, and God doesn't take that away from us because our free will has to be engaged in our lives, in our process. The half one was I was walking up and down the corridor again, and there was this young guy standing in the doorway, and he had a house coat on, so obviously he was not just visiting. And he looks at me and says, hey, you, you a priest? I said, yeah, who wants to know? Because uh, you hear uh, giving communion or something? I said, well, uh, I'm actually here visiting this other family, but I do have communion with me. Would you like to receive communion? No! I'm mad at God. At the top of his lungs in the hallway. I said, oh, really? Tell me about that. He goes, well, you know, I, he's in his early 30s. I'm sick, and I've been sick for a while, and they can't find out what it is, and I've got a business, and if I'm not in my business, I'm not earning money, and it's creating problems, you know, with my girlfriend, because we're not bringing it in, and you know, I, why? he goes this whole litany, and then he says, I'm not a bad guy, why is God punishing me this way? Why is God doing this to me? I said to him, well, I certainly can't answer that question, come on, but maybe I have something to help you. Would you like to receive the anointing of the sick? And he answered, I'm not that sick. <laughs> he had sacrament of the dying in his head, right? So I looked at him and I said, I see here, buddy, okay? You're standing here in the hallway complaining about God's not doing anything for you. And one of God's representatives shows up <laughs> and offers you exactly the thing that you need and you turn it down, make up your mind. But it changed the conversation and it turned out the reason he didn't want anointing is because he was kind of afraid it might work. And he knew that if he did get healed, he was going to owe God something. That's how he felt, and he didn't want to owe God anything. He'd rather complain than owe God something. It shows that, you know, one of the aspects of virtue and vice that I talked about earlier, gratitude is one of the most important spiritual virtues there is. So much so that the word Eucharist actually means thank you. Anybody here who knows some Greek? The Greek word for thank you is efkaristo, Eucharist. The Eucharist is actually the worship of gratitude, giving gratitude to God. And that's what he really didn't want. It was an honest exchange, I'll give him that. Um, I like to think the sacrament didn't do anything because he didn't receive it, but the offer of the sacrament may have changed something. The sacraments are divine interventions. Mundane miracles, but very powerful. Um, and sometimes we can be a bit like, well, I'm not that sick, or do I really need that, or oh my gosh, I don't know, it's so much effort or whatever. To some degree, if we have access to miracles, we should probably go for them. You know, the, the sacraments, I, sometimes I wish the sacraments were a little flashier because it might be uh, the miracles were a little flashier. It might, be, it might make my job easier, you know? 
But, uh, but again, the Lord wants us to choose. All of this ultimately comes down to love. Love is a choice. No one can be hypnotized into loving someone else. We cannot build robots to love us. Because love that is not chosen, that is not free, is not love. And since God is love, our spiritual wellness ultimately is about the choice of love. Love of God and love each other. And that's why sin's a problem. That's why stretching the soul and building virtue is a great thing. That's why the miracles are mundane. Because they live, leave plenty of room for us to choose. It comes back to being people of healthy and free choice, the choice to love. And that, my friends, is the ultimate measure of spiritual wellness. So I invite all of us to consider these four categories of spiritual wellness and ask ourselves, where are we? How are we doing? How's our conscience doing? How's our knowledge of our faith doing? How's our practice of the sacraments doing? How is our ability to let God speak to us doing, or are we loaded with distraction? You measure those, and you know how you're doing, and you measure spiritual wellness. Thank you, and God bless you. I think we're right on time in terms of our schedule as well. Just as Natty is getting the gift, I just want to say a few words of thanks. Uh, thank you for the reminders. Um, you know, a lot of things resonated, but one of them that has resonated with me is the importance of uh, who is the responsibility on taking care of ourselves, and it has to begin with us. And I know sometimes when we get into these roles or we get into our personal lives, we kind of put us, uh, ourselves, on the back burner. And sometimes we think, well, that's just the selfless thing to do, but um, sometimes we need to try and figure out what is important to take care of ourselves. And um, the spiritual development piece is sometimes goes by the wayside, and I'm the first to admit that. So um, encouraging us to have that conversation, that spiritual conversation. Um, you've given us a lot to think about, me to think about my position, how we can bring that spiritual development to each of you, because I know you're so busy. <laughs> and, uh, so I think it's our responsibility as a senior team to help bring that back to you so that you can bring it back to all of our students. So thank you for being with us. My pleasure. And uh, I'm glad God sent you as his representative to us. <laughs> <laughs> for as long, stay as long as you want. Love you. Well, retirement for bishops is 75, so one year down, 24 to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think the person yeah. Right there you go. Here's a little something. Though. So just on behalf of the, the Here and Superior Administrative Team, we appreciate that you are here with us today for our retreat. So thanks again. That's very kind. I appreciate it. You can tell I'm a teacher at heart myself, so uh, I, I love being able to talk about these things. Um, not just because I gave my life to them, but I have been personally nourished by all of this. Uh, I, I used to go, I was originally in business school. I was in the corporate world. I'm not the same guy that I was then, and it's thanks to prayer and sacraments and teaching and all of that stuff. I'd like to think I became better. I offer no guarantees, but uh, I, I encourage all of us. Uh, I don't know, ultimately it's about the grace of God. I don't know anybody who became a worse person by being more and more open to God's grace, living by God's grace. And I know a lot of people whose lives were greatly improved uh, by that openness. So I encourage you all, and if you're ever looking for a spiritual coach, uh, or even just a spiritual question. We don't have Catholic schools in Quebec where I'm from, but we did have a couple of Catholic private schools, and one of the teachers, we were friends on Facebook, so if the students were asking a question and didn't quite know how to tackle it, he would say, let me message the bishop, and he'd message me, and I'd be like, oh, okay, so I'd message back, and, or put me on speakerphone with the class. He got a lot of cred with the students, I'll tell you. Um, I remember those with great fondness, so if I can ever be of assistance to any of you, a uh, student asks a question, even if I can't take the call right away, uh, feel free to contact me, and I'd be very happy to, uh, to offer what I can, even like a video response or something like that, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.